Church family, would you believe me if I told you that the first great paradise of God was not a garden called Eden, and it was never intended to be. The first great paradise of God was meant to be the heart of Adam and Eve. For the book of Revelation says the dwelling place of God is with man. Paul wrote about the gospel that Christ will dwell in our hearts by faith. But you know the story of the Bible. This place, the heart of man that was supposed to be the paradise of God, or the temple where God's glory and presence would dwell, is now the habitation of demons. But by the cleansing of the blood of Christ, the human heart can once again become the dwelling place of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the place in man where we commune with God, where we talk with God, where we fellowship with God, and I can prove it to you. Would you grab your Bibles and come with me this morning to Mark chapter 7, and I want to examine the first 23 verses. Bible teachers and scholars hold that Mark 7 is the seminal passage on the teaching of Jesus. This is a core teaching in the Master's message to the world. This is an anchor text in understanding the entire ministry of Jesus. And so in Mark chapter 7... I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1 and go all the way down to verse number 23. And as always, church family, I want to remind you, the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it because this is God's infallible, inerrant Word. Now watch Mark 7, verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and there are Many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Watch now. And he said, Jesus said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Ouch. Hypocrites, as it is written. Here's the hypocrisy. This people honors me with their lips. They talk the talk, but their heart is far from me. So as a result, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold it to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, here's that famous commandment from the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you may have gained from me is already given to God. I don't owe you a thing. I will not help you in your old age. I will not help you in your financial distress. I have given everything to God. I am absolved from the responsibility to honor you as the commands of God teach. Now notice verse 12. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and many such things you do. And then he called the people to him again and said to them, listen to me, hear me, all of you, and work hard to understand. Think about what I'm telling you. There is nothing outside a person that go, by going into him can defile him, but the thing that comes out or the things that come out of a person are what defile him. 
And then the second time, when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said, are you also my own disciples? You don't get it? You don't understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not into his heart, but into his stomach and expelled, thus he declared all foods clean. And many of the Jews who had come to Christ would still struggle with that uh, teaching of Jesus. Keep Peter in mind in the book of Acts. Now notice what Jesus said. What comes out of a person is what defiles him for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This text shows us how to destroy the temple of God, the heart of man, and perpetuate the evil that is within. Let me show you in the first five verses that um, you need to elevate. If you're going to be the hypocrite that Jesus charged the Pharisees with, you will elevate tradition over truth. That's in the first five verses. Man's traditions and our rituals and our religions are elevated beyond the power of the teaching of Jesus and the commandment of God's word. So we elevate our religion, our denominations, our, uh, our traditions, in this case the Jewish traditions of the elders, above the truth that came in God's word in the Old Testament and verified through Jesus. I'm going to just mention this in passing because you wouldn't notice it in simply reading the text, but the posture of the Pharisees and the scribes in questioning Jesus publicly was an attempt to shame him because in that ancient shame and honor culture, in challenging a rabbi or a teacher or somebody in a place of honor publicly, you were actually shaming them and attempting to embarrass them. That in itself was an act of shame. So the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees didn't think twice about questioning Jesus publicly. You'll notice later on in the text that the disciples asked Jesus about it privately because that was the appropriate way to do that in an ancient culture. So just remember, will you, that age and position doesn't give you the right to assume you are always right. These men were in the position of spiritual authority, but they were dead wrong. Notice also, secondarily, uh, just by means of a, a quick mention of it in the text, that the passage makes it very clear that Jesus encouraged the freedom of conscience among his disciples. Did you notice the observation of the Pharisees about Jesus' disciples? Some of your disciples. So apparently some of them thought that they needed to continue in some of the traditions of washing their hands before they ate. But there were others who did not, which is the way Jesus wants it. He doesn't command us to all think the same thing about everything. There are core beliefs that we share as convictions of being a Christian. But on many things, Jesus encourages the freedom of conscience about things like traditions and religious rituals. And that brings us to the heart of these first five verses. Jesus is telling us the truth about traditions. Now, don't make the wrong conclusion. Jesus is not saying that traditions in themselves are wrong, but traditions that become more important than truth are his target in the text. So it goes like this in our world. When the canons of a church cancel out the teaching of the Bible, they are dead wrong. And in evangelical churches, when our church constitutions hold more weight and authority than the commandments of the Bible, we have become hypocrites. So in our own interpretation of the law of God has more weight and authority and power than the teaching of God's word. We've become hypocrites. 
that's Jesus' point. Evangelicals, by the way, have as many traditions as the mainline churches, and we are as susceptible to breaking this teaching of Jesus as anyone else. But notice what Jesus said to them. This has just become absolutely absurd. He says, you will go to great lengths to keep your traditions, all the while being blinded to the, to the truth and authority of God's word. What a tragic state in which the human heart is existing. When the blinding light of truth is shining in your face and all you can see is your traditions, your religious rituals, your denominational allegiance, and you totally miss the law of God, the heart of Christ. It was so absurd in the first century that by the time that Jesus arrived, there were pages, hundreds of pages of the tra traditions of the elders, including something like 40 or 50 pages just on what a person could or couldn't do on the Sabbath, one of which included you could not wear your false teeth on the Sabbath because if they happened to fall out or you spit them on the ground, picking them up would constitute labor. That's how absurd the laws became. I suppose we've all been stung to some degree by legalism. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But I remember once standing in line at a Christian school, feeling deeply humiliated that we were not permitted to enter unless the headmaster of our school cut our hair off our collars because it was getting too long. That's a spiritual wound on the heart of man because... Man's legalistic laws and traditions are more important than cleansing the heart from sin. Which, by the way, is why Jesus was ticked at the Pharisees. Because they twisted what was meant in the law. You know what was meant in the law, don't you? It was the cleansing of the defilement of our sin. That was God's heart all along. God wanted to cleanse us from the guilt of our sin. But the Pharisees now were more concerned about external behavior than they were true guilt and the forgiveness of our notorious sin. Isn't that what David was crying out for after he sinned in a rather extreme way? Adultery, murder, cover-up as the national leader of Israel after a year or so when the prophet came to confront him and David's heart finally broke in repentance. Do you remember what he said? He said, purge me. He prayed, cleanse me. He prayed, wash me. He came to verse 10 and he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Because that's God's that's the purpose of the law, was to show us our sin so that it would drive us to God's grace to receive the forgiveness of our sins. So the dwelling place of God is in man's heart. But the way that we can shroud God's presence is elevating tradition over truth. Number two, let me show you in verses six and seven, you value appearance over reality. You heard it when I read it. A cataclysmic rupture took place in these Pharisees. What they said and what they were experiencing in their heart are two different things. Jesus said, these people are honoring me with their words, but their hearts are cold. How cold were they? Jesus went so far as to say in Matthew chapter 23 of these same Pharisees, You've created a beautiful monument on the top of a grave, but inside you are full of dead men's bones. That's how cold they were. They were cold as a dead human being. So here's, here's a, an obsession with what we look like to others in the external, but having no interest and certainly no power in really experiencing the deep transformation of the desires of the human heart. And so Jesus impugned them. In vain you are worshiping me. 
By the way, remember that uh, when Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel, he went through all the sons of Jesse, and uh, uh, Jesse said, that's, the, that's all, all, the, those are all my boys. And, and Samuel said, but there what, must be one more. And he said, well, there is. He's out looking after the sheep. And in that, remember in that context, Samuel said, excuse me, Jesse said to Samuel, uh, man doesn't see the way God sees, for God doesn't look on the outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. God's examining our hearts right now. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, examine the heart. God sees right through your smile. God sees right through your show. God sees right through the veneer that we try to portray to others because he wants us to deal with the real problem. The cataclysmic rupture is when our words don't match the reality of our hearts, what we're in truth experiencing and living. And the cataclysmic result is that we offer to God vain worship. What is vain worship? We teach as doctrine the commandments of men. We elevate our ways over God's way. It creates a heart that is incapable of transformation and true change. And so Jesus impugned those ancient Pharisees and he called them hypocrites. Now that'll sting, won't it? Let me just remind you that it's not hypocrisy for sinners to worship. In fact, worship is the cure for hypocrisy. It's all in how you come to worship. If you come to worship posturing that you are living a holy life, but you know you are far from God, you're a hypocrite. But if you come to God and say, I, I don't know that I should say a word today because my heart is cold. My heart is hard. My heart is sinful. I'm proud. I'm stubborn. That's the kind of worship God receives. Come to him hungry for the true holiness that he offers. So the dwelling place of God is with man. But we can pervert his dwelling place by elevating tradition over truth and appearance over reality. Don't underestimate the pull of you wanting to appear stronger, better than you are, rather than seeking reality. I took a bad fall the other day. We, uh, my, our kids gave us a new puppy, and he's a runner. And I opened the front door and went out to get the newspaper out of my mailbox, and I turned around and I saw him making a beeline out the door, and as I pivoted to try and stop him, I fell face first into a bush at the end of our, uh, our steps. I did a face plan into the bush. I slammed into the ground and, and lost my bearings for a moment, knocked my glasses off, and April came running. Are you okay? Are you okay? When I dug myself out of the snow and crawled back up onto the cement slab, I stood up momentarily, and I said to April, get in. Did anybody see it? Did anybody see it? Isn't that how we all feel? We don't want anybody to see our real fall. But God says, bring it to me. Bring it to me, and I will put you back up on your feet, because that's what he loves to do. Let me show you thirdly how these ancient Pharisees perverted the paradise of God into hypocrisy. They observe legalism over love in verses 8 through 13. You see, legalism is a distortion of the truth, which makes it so dangerous they take the law of God, and Jesus charged them in this text with having an extraordinary ability to twist and pervert the law to their own advantage, which means, of course, that they were not submitting themselves to the law of God, they were submitting the law of God to themselves. But they take, that's what's so dangerous about legalism. Yeah, you become obsessed with finding a way 
to tell yourself that you're actually keeping the law when you have broken it. And the Holy Spirit is trying to show us, of course, the danger of us thinking we have the power to reinterpret God's law rather than accepting it as the authority as it is. Isn't it interesting? I wondered if Jesus said this somewhat tongue-in-cheek. You have finesse. You go to great lengths to pervert the teaching of God's law to maintain your traditions. So Jesus is actually saying legalism, which is a distorted view of the truth, legalism often has parts of the truth in it. That's what makes it so confusing and deadly to many of us. That's why it is such a trap for so many Christians, because they preach the Bible, but they pervert the Bible in a legalistic way, and they distort the truth. But in the end, legalism results in rejecting, leaving, and canceling the Word of God. Now, in this paragraph, Jesus used a very powerful example. The ones you should love most, or I probably should say, the ones that you love first in your life and probably love the longest in your life is your mother and father. And the commandment of God is that you should honor them till they die. You should take care of them and provide for them physical, spiritual, and emotional needs. It is damnable to desert your responsibility, yea, your obligation before God to take care of your parents. But of course, the traditionalists and the legalists found a way to say, hey, just give us all your money. It happens all the time. Churches and preachers, televangelists, steal money from those who don't have enough to support their family. They extort money from those who do not have enough to take care of the people the Bible commands them to care for under the guise of using the money for God. Jesus is rebuking not only the people who practice such an abominable act, but the Pharisees who backed it and enabled it. And of course, he's saying the, the goal of God's law is love. It, it, is, it is that the teaching of the Bible is never meant to cut you off from the people that you love. God's intent is that we love not just our moms and dads, but like him, we love the world. God loves the world. Legalism tears the heart out of you because you become more obsessed with the keeping of rituals and traditions than you actually do in the experience of loving others. You know how you're growing in God's grace? Because you have an increasing capacity to love people, especially those who irritate you and those who are your enemies and those that you find it hard to get along with. The way you know that grace is nurtured in your life is that the law of God is reaching its goal and you can love more now than you ever have loved before. Let me show you the fourth way that these legalists perverted the dwelling place of God. They chose compliance over choice. That's in verses 14 and 18. I won't spend a lot of time on this, and I'm not happy at all with the choice of my words because it doesn't really capture what this passage is saying. So in verses 14 and 18, twice, Jesus took the people that seemed to care about what he was saying, apart from the Pharisees, and said first to the greater crowd, hey, just use your head. Just think about this. Don't take the word for it. Understand what I'm saying. And then he doubled down with his disciples. He was even a bit more surprised that they, of all people, didn't get what he was saying. So I think what he's trying to do is saying that your passion for growing in grace and spiritual learning is more important than being in, living in compliance with institutional religion. Very often, the person who keeps on growing in grace will break from their religious traditions because the Word of God guides them on the true path toward the heart of God. I experienced this as a young Christian. 
I was nurtured in a King James only environment, and when I got old enough, I began to question the logic behind the King James only. Uh, position. And as I questioned it, I realized it wasn't a tenable position. I wasn't angry at anybody about it. I just thought I can no longer teach this and espouse it, and I need to go in a different direction because I started using my own mind. What Jesus is really saying, legalists, traditionalists, always want to do your thinking for you. Jesus wants you to think for yourself. Religionists, Legalists want you to take their word and their interpretation of their law. If you are part of a spiritual community where you are not permitted to question at any level what's happening and what's being taught, find a new church. I'm not talking, as you know, about questioning the gospel of Christ and the teachings of Jesus. But I am telling you that there's got to be room for people to be able to think for themselves. I hope you can say of your spiritual journey, you are where you are because you've engaged your brain. Really, all Jesus was saying in these two references is, use your brain. Use, forgive me, but I say to my kids, use your noodle. Use your noodle. That's your brain. Think about it for yourself. The wonderful thing about being a Christian is that wisdom is not nat nat normally or naturally necessarily attached to your IQ. You may not have a very high IQ, but you can be extremely spiritually discerning and you can know the grace of God in your heart. Lastly, let me show you the nail in the coffin of these hypocrites is that they trusted law, they chose law over grace. In verses 15 to 23, we have Jesus' strongest argument for the necessity of grace. It is one of the most unsettling passages in the whole teaching of Jesus when he says, let me tell you what really lies beneath in the human heart. But he does it for a gracious reason. And if you bypass this, you've missed the heart of the gospel. In fact, William Barclay said, this is well nigh the most revolutionary passage in the entire New Testament because he's addressing the real problem of humanity. The problem of humanity is the human heart. It's depraved. Everything about us has been tainted by sin and sin originates in the heart of man. And so what does he say? The list is gruesome. The list is unsettling. The list is ugly even just to read. But Jesus is asking us to take responsibility for what really lies beneath in the spirit of our hearts. Here's what he says. For from within, out of your heart, comes evil thoughts. The word means evil reasonings in your own mind. Sexual immorality, it's the word from which we take the word pornography, pornographic, uh, immoral living, theft, obvious, isn't it, murder, adultery, greed. Greed is an appetite for what belongs to others. Man, I know members of this church that have to have one up on everybody else. Somebody buys a new car, they have to buy a nicer new car. Somebody gets a promotion, they have to get a bigger promotion. Somebody, whatever. That's greed. It exists in our, all of our hearts. It may not be the sin that stumbles you right now, but you have the potential to be a greedy person. Wickedness is a heart which is completely equipped to inflict evil on anybody. You ever watch some of those video clips like the Asian Canadian woman who was dragged, excuse me, Asian American woman who was dragged last week at the, behind a car in Southern California and there's a lady filming it. And I'm thinking, why aren't you helping? You're standing on the sidewalk. But let go of your handbag. The car's dragging you. Apparently it was a racially motivated attack. 
But there was all kinds of wickedness going on. A wicked person driving the car, a wicked person not letting go of their purse, a wicked person watching the pain but doing nothing about it. Wickedness abounds everywhere. Deceit means to bait and lie to people. Sensuality involves plunging into moral debauchery and not being the least bit embarrassed or ashamed about it. It means debauchery to defy public opinion. Envy refers to an eye, an evil eye which watches somebody else's possessions. Slander. May I just say to you, church family, don't repost slanderous stuff on Twitter and Facebook. Slander is maligning somebody else's character, even if it's true. Why would you want to repeat someone's garbage online? Pride is the sin of self-praising, always having contempt for others. Pride is, you've always got to have the last word. You always got to talk, let somebody else talk about their experience, but you can't wait to talk about your experience. How many people do you know that seem genuinely interested in other people, which is the heart of Jesus? Most of us listen long enough just so that somebody else will shut up and we can start talking. Jesus says our hearts are evil and think only about ourselves, and they must be trained by grace to think of others. The word foolishness describes a person who is desensitized both morally and spiritually. See, all the law can do All the law can do is turn a brilliant spotlight on the truth of your heinous sin. But Jesus magnifies it to say there's only one possible radical change in the human heart, and I came to give it. You tracking with me, church family? He shows us the ugly truth of our sinful heart so that he can quickly pivot to tell us there's nothing we can do on our own, but by his grace, he will give us a new heart, a new nature, and a new birth. Because that's why Jesus said in John chapter 3, don't be surprised, don't marvel at this. I'm telling you that unless a man is born from above, is born again, is regenerated from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus' antidote to the heinous sin of our hearts is the new birth. It's because it brings a great miracle into our lives. We become brand new people. The way to escape the torture of our heinous sin is by becoming a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, If any man is in Christ, if any woman is in Christ... They are a brand new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's why Jesus, at the end of time, said, I will make all things new. So let me just touch on this briefly because I'm over time, by three minutes, so it's not too bad yet. But let me just point something out for you. Because some of you who are faithful believers are sitting out there and you're saying, but I still struggle with some of these sins or all of these sins from time to time. What is that about? Because the insertion of the new nature in your life creates a permanent internal conflict. The flesh, Peter said, the flesh wars against your spirit. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, they are in opposition to each other and they often are clashing in your soul. The day I woke up to that reality was the day I felt free as a bird. That this tension in my soul is by divine appointment. When I sin, the Spirit convicts. When I'm tempted to sin, the Spirit warns me. And when I'm tempted to live in the power of the flesh rather than being filled with the Spirit, the Spirit is creating an internal conflict. So this list should really tell us we should be, we should be shocked at our sin but never surprised. Absolutely shocked when a brother or sister is overtaken in a fault but we should never be surprised. 
because the seeds of destruction lay buried in our old flesh. And we must learn to walk as the new creation. We are church family, live as a new creation. My conclusion is simply this. What are you going to choose? Ritual? Religion? In attempting to save yourself so that you're always in control and you can boast before God and God is your slave? Are you going to choose ritual? Or are you going to choose relationship? The call of the gospel is to come to Jesus, invite him into your heart by faith, that he may dwell in your heart by faith, and the new creation is is made in you, and you get to walk as the new man that you are or the new woman that you are. Father, please call those who are caught in their sin and are blinded in their ways. Call them now to yourself and to a relationship with you. Show them, Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that you can set them free from the bondage of their sin and the guilt of their sin and the damnation of their sin and draw them to you. And I pray that you would bless and empower and encourage your people today to walk as the new man or new woman that they are in Christ. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.